Adam is a type, as expressed in Romans 5.14, there's some way that Adam is a type of Christos, him who's anointed. And so I want to say, for the purpose of reflection tonight, what is it that Adam and Jesus have in common? In other words, there's some way that Adam is a type of him who's anointed, but what way can we say the way Adam is, Jesus later comes on the scene and he is that same way? Well, it's obviously not the issue of sin because Adam had sin, Jesus doesn't have sin. So what could it possibly be that would unveil why to us Adam and Jesus have something in common? Well, I say that what Adam and Jesus have in common is that they're both men because the Word in John 1.14 became human and lived among us. So we know Adam is created by God as the first man. God came into human flesh in the form of Jesus. So there's something in common between Adam and Jesus. They're both men. But another thing that they have in common is that they're both representative men. In other words, they both represent the same group of people. And the group of people that they represent is what we refer to as humanity. And when I have the God's Word version with me tonight, it's because I like the way that they actually render the verses in Romans 5, which follow the fundamental statement that we're focused on at the moment, Romans 5.14, Adam is a type of Christ. Adam has something in common with Jesus to the extent that Adam is the first example of it and Jesus is the ultimate example of it. Well, that being that Adam as a man represented in what I'm referring to as a group identity, a shared identity, all descendants of Adam are considered, if you will, Adamites. In other words, it's like having the last name of Adam I said earlier, as if my last name were Adam, Bob Adam. Well, Jesus is the same way. Jesus, as the man that he is, represents all people as far as God is concerned because he is, in one scripture, even referred to as the last Adam. Just for reference sake, I would like to say that in 1 Corinthians, we've already spoken of 1 Corinthians earlier. Well, I'll just say that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, there's actually a statement that is made concerning the identity of who Jesus is as the last Adam. And it's actually a comparison with the first man when it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the first man became a living soul and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Well, there you have what Adam has in common with Jesus. You know, both are individual men, but both also have a group that is represented in who they are in terms of their relationship with God. And so the point in Romans 5.14 of bringing both men together, Adam is a type of Christ, Adam is a pattern, Adam is an image of Christ, is that both men are group identity personalities. So you can even say both are group personalities. And here's what's fantastic about Romans 5 in general. Romans 5 in general shows us the concept of grace, which doesn't come until Jesus arrives on the scene, but to fully grasp what this gift is referring to in Romans 5, it really helps to understand what it meant to first be identified in Adam. And there's a negative association with that first 
sin of the Bible, Garden of Eden eating forbidden fruit. There's a negative association for human beings with that original guilt. But if we can grasp the principle that it wasn't a matter of the individual living today that contributed to their eating forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, then it's easier to understand the gift and the grace of God that does not involve our contribution. We living today don't have anything to do with why Jesus in history totally pleased God to the extent that he resurrected because he deserved to live. Why? Because of his righteousness that this gift is now humanity's gift because Jesus as the group identity now means that everybody has unconditionally a right relationship with God because of Jesus who approaches the Father in perfection on behalf of all the people that were first represented by a negative representative Adam. And so this is what Romans 5 is going to be getting into. But if we just review for a moment what we've said so far tonight is that in talking about the foundational issue that is alluded to in our first scripture this evening, 1 Corinthians 3.11, where there's one foundation, there's no other one that's been laid, there's just the one Jesus who's anointed. This means that in the analogy of building, in our relationship with God, we need to understand, first of all, that our relationship with God doesn't depend on us. It depends on Jesus. In other words, before we were even born, Jesus already lived the Christian life. And he did it in such a way that as the group identity, then we've all got credit for living the Christian life. Everyone on the planet does have credit for living the Christian life. Why? Because Jesus, the last Adam, as alluded to in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Well, this is in contrast to the way that the first man, Adam, had the penalty of death over his head. And if you consider that God wasn't satisfied to have a negative representation for the human race in the first man that he created, he was only satisfied with coming into humanity in his action in Jesus and so taking on the association of all people that the cross, which is a subject we haven't gotten into yet tonight, but later in Romans 6, we will certainly get into the cross because in Romans 6, when we later get there, then we've got seven verses in a row that are going to be telling us the application of our death, our crucifixion, because Jesus took on the whole association with the human race, even to the extent that he took on an identification with the sins that we commit, the ones that we did commit, will commit, are committing now. Jesus so absorbed that whole representation of what it means to be Adam that he actually died on the cross as if he were all people getting what all people deserve, namely death. And then on the side of resurrection, which Romans 6 gets into as well, the side of resurrection, we're to be putting it on our account, Romans 6, 11 specifically, we're to be putting it on our account that we have a relationship with God that is very much in the positive, very much in the realm of possessing eternal life because of who Jesus is, as the group identity who now stands in the position of where all people stand and that's righteous, not because of something that we have done. In fact, we weren't even born yet when Jesus did his righteousness on behalf of everybody. Yet, this good news that Romans 5 is unveiling is something that in discussion tonight we said is better understood when we look at Romans 5.14 and see the statement, Adam is a tupos, Adam is a type or a pattern or an image of Christ. Christ is him who's anointed. How is Adam and Jesus to be set 
in Romans 5.14 as Adam being a type of Jesus? Well, both are group identity people. Both represent the same group, namely all people. Why? Because what Adam did for the negative for humanity, Jesus has done for the positive to erase the effect of sin and establish righteousness in the unconditional manner that gives him glory and praise for being our savior, our righteousness, and everything else for which we praise him as we begin to see how Romans 5 unfolds. But if we just take one quick mention of Romans 5.15, just one quick mention of Romans 5.15, then we'll be able to take a, a break. But we'll just get through Romans 5.15. Having said something about Romans 5.14, Adam is a type of Christ. Now, listen to the way that the God's Word version renders Romans 5.15. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and put up verse 15 right here. Romans 5.15. And listen for a moment to the way that the God's Word version puts this. I'm just going to read Romans 5. 15. There's no comparison between God's gift and Adam's failure. Came and compare 